I'm sure you've seen several chimeras in popular media. Some are mythological creatures that just basically exist, while some are experimental subjects that, in many cases, are not exactly successful. But how realistic it is to be able to make an experimental chimera, and even if it's possible, will someone even do it for real? Well, I mean, you had most likely seen the thumbnail already, so let me broad up the question. What exactly is parabiosis? So actually, parabiosis as a term is used in at least two different contexts. Para means sight, and bios means life, so basically, living besides. It's quite a generic term etymology-wise. In ecology, parabiosis is uncommonly used to describe the phenomenon when two organisms of different groups shared the same living condition. To be precise, it was used by August Forel for when different species of ants peacefully shared the same nest. But of course, that's not the context of this video. The parabiosis that we're gonna talk about is the surgical joining of two living organisms so that they share a single physiological system. So let's talk about the history. Now, how did this peculiar experiment begin? What's the origin? Well, that is, the Siamese twin the fascinating condition of two brothers that are now commonly known as conjoined twin. Back then, two centuries ago, this was a really unique phenomenon. Scientists are asking many questions. But of course, they cannot exactly do experiments on the twins, because that's unethical. And so, in the 1860s, Paul Bird introduced the technique. What he did was, he took two albino mice, cut the skin on one of their sides, and stitch them together. Quite simple, and perhaps unbelievable, but it worked. What he found was, the circulatory system of both mice will combine into one integrated system. That was phenomenal, and that was his doctoral thesis, published as Le Greffe Animal. I probably butchered the pronunciation, but yeah, it's French. In 1866, he was awarded the prize for experimental physiology of the French Academy of Science. So now, we got a model to study conjoined twins, an artificially created one. But still, the method was rough, so the mortality rate was high. For a couple decades, this experiment was not recreated at all. That was until 1908, when Sauerbruch and Heide revived the technique and called it parabiosis. Well, to be precise, they called it parabiose because they are German after all. In 1933, Bunster and Meyer revised the protocol to increase the success rate. That protocol was the basis of today's parabiosis methodology. Oh, and yes, parabiosis experiments are still going on to this day. So, this publication actually provides the video. But I don't think YouTube will allow me to show the whole process because of graphic imagery, so I'm just gonna show the gist of it. You can check out the publication if you want to watch the video. Basically, after the mice are anesthetized, you shave this area, sterilize it, and then perform incision of the skin. Then, you stitch them together, connecting the knee joint also. But remember, that's the gist of it. The detailed steps are provided in the publication. If you follow the procedure correctly, the mice will most likely survive. And yes, they can live and function as an organism. Well, I'm not sure if calling them an organism is correct, but yeah. As you can see here, they can move around, they can eat, etc. And what's most important is, they can be separated safely, even after 9 months without complication, by following the procedure that is. So yeah, now a protocol is established, so there's a lot more parabiosis experiment going on since then. And not just limited to mice, some other animals are used to. So let's talk about it, but before that, let's talk about this one first. Most of you can probably guess what this is. 
its axolotl, well, two axolotls joined together. Apparently, the axolotl stuck on the back did not eat at all, but both survived for two and a half years, so that's quite something. So, what was the research purposes? Well, it's actually somewhat political. Have you ever heard of Lysenkoism? Lysenko was a Soviet biologist that opposed the natural selection and hereditary genetic theory. He wanted to prove that environmental factors can affect life to, basically, whatever extent. That belief was prevalent in the USSR, and also East Germany. Basically, George Snyder, which was the researcher that did this experiment, wanted to support Lysenkoism by proving he could change hereditary characters through environmental influence. And that environmental influence was, apparently, sticking multiple animals together. Now, he did not exactly succeed, but at the very least, his research was insightful for… something, which I'm gonna talk about in next week's video actually. And now, let's talk about this one. What exactly is going on in this image? Well, let me tell you. The image on the left side is a polyphemous silkworm pupa parabios into a headless cacrophia moth. By headless, I mean, yes, they decapitate the moth. They cut the integument of the pupa and then stick both of them together with wax. The result? Well, the wings are still flapping, energetically even. Meanwhile, the image on the right is a pupa joined with an abdomen. By that I mean, they cut off the abdomen of an adult moth and then stick it to a pupa. Oh, by the way, this test was done between multiple species and of different sexes. So now, the question, what exactly were they doing? What did they wanted to find out? That is, juvenile hormones. So, let me briefly talk about juvenile hormones first. In metamorphosing insect, juvenile hormones are secreted by corpora alata, or corpus alatum, if singular. Corpora alata are generally located inside the head. Now, how juvenile hormones work is, to put it simply, it promotes larval growth, but prevents metamorphosis. As long as there is a lot of juvenile hormones produced, larva will keep growing. When it gets depleted, they will stop growing and then start metamorphosing. During pupil stage, corpora alata are not active. Now, the idea of this experiment was, by joining the physiological system of pupa and adult, the juvenile hormones of the adult can, in theory, flow to the pupa and influence the growth. If corpora alata are strictly located inside the head, by removing the head, Minimum number of juvenile hormones should be produced. That way, the pupa will metamorphose into adult as always. However, if juvenile hormones are located elsewhere, then the pupa will retain the pupal characteristics because of the work of juvenile hormones. And the result of the experiment was, male Cacropia and Cynthia moths have juvenile hormones inside their abdomen. Hence, the pupae develop into moths while still retaining many pupal characters. However, the juvenile hormones are still produced by the corpora alata inside the head. So if the head was cut early, no juvenile hormones can be found inside their abdomen. Now, if you ask me, what exactly is the practical use of this information? I have no idea. Physiology is not my forte at all and I'm not even gonna pretend. At the very least, plus one knowledge for us. Us means human, I mean. So, I did say parabiosis is getting very popular nowadays. Or if I didn't, then I'll say it now. But what exactly are they doing it for? Well, the generic answer is… medic. It was initially used to study hormones and transplantation research, and even cancer. But if we're talking the current years, the catchiest idea from parabiosis is heterochronic parabiosis. Basically, parabiosis protocol applied to one young and one old individual. For what? Aging research. To be precise, to combat aging. You know, 
the promise of rejuvenation, reverse aging, etc. That had been one of the interests for humans. You had probably seen that premise in movies or other popular media, right? Well now, does it work? Well, yes, kinda. The young components do outweigh the old component, to some extent. That includes hormones, enzymes, blood cells, RNAs, and other circulating factors. It can even potentially alleviate Alzheimer's disease. But emphasis on potentially. It's ongoing research. A doctor or someone in medical field could probably tell you a lot more about that. Since I'm just a humble zoologist, let me get back to talking about the animals. The problem with parabiosis, especially for heterochronic parabiosis, is balance. As you could most likely imagine, conjoining two different individuals can be quite iffy for their life. One individual will most likely be more dominant than the other one. It's like getting dragged along doing something that you don't want to. Actually, do you know about the cat-dog cartoon? Basically like that. Those who watch cat-dog will have an idea of how destructive that life could be. Now, there are some things that can be done to alleviate this. Which is, to put it simply, pick two individuals that are almost identical. But yeah, of course that's not exactly practical especially for heterochronic parabiosis. There are also several stuff that must be considered like physiological compatibility, especially immune system. So yeah, even though parabiosis is potentially life-changing for human as a species even, some consideration and extra effort need to be done to keep the research ethical. New protocols keep being designed and published to ensure a good practice can be maintained. So yeah, who knows what breakthrough will be achieved in the future? For now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, this is not the extent of chimeric stuff in real life. I'm gonna talk about another one for next week's video like I hinted earlier. If you're interested, make sure you come back and check that out. Anyway, enjoy your day.